Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, especially patrons of our Patreon. Get an ad-free version of the show and more at patreon.com slash DTNS. Coming up on the DTNS Weekend Edition, are continual camera upgrades a good thing? Is camera marketing broken? And what gear do you bring to CES? This is the photography news for the month of November and December 2022. Playing a little catch up here in lovely Cleveland, Ohio. I'm Rich Straffolino. And from the tundra lands northwest of Canada, I'm Anthony Lemos. You know, during the the weeks and months, photography news sometimes, it gets lost in the shuffle. Let's face it. So we come to you on the weekend to shine the spotlight on the best bits. Let's get a bit of photo news you might have missed. In recent years, scientists have identified a number of materials that form atomically thin sheets. Graphene is probably the most common, but a number of semiconductors have been used to make atom-thick sheets of material. A team of researchers at Penn State published a paper in the journal Nature Materials demonstrating a 900-pixel image sensor using these super-thin materials. Rather than using a silicon semiconductor like a standard CMOS sensor, the team used molybdenum disulfide, which can hit atomically thin dimensions. The researchers noticed, noted it took remarkably little power to operate it, less than a picojoule per pixel in operation, and were able to modulate signal-to-noise sensitivity without external circuitry. Just don't expect to shoot sports with the sensor. As researchers found, it took multiple seconds per color channel to capture a full high contrast image. Man, I, 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 anything with graphene is cool. And now I guess I have to like uh, molydendrum disulfide materials. Molly, too. Mo- molly B, we used to use it on airplanes for uh, uh-huh. lubric- lubricants and sealants. Yeah. Probably the, the thicker, slightly thicker versions, several <laughs> atoms. <laughs> several, several. Yeah, like three or four. Yeah. There you go. All right. Well, the image editing software suite Capture One announced changes to how it will treat its perpetual license. The company will shift away from major annual releases, instead shipping new features on a rolling basis. As a result, new perpetual licenses will include bug fixes until the next version, but not new features released after purchase. Perpetual license, I guess, may contain less perpetuality. The company will also no longer offer upgrade pricing, but will announce a new loyalty scheme. That is their language I'm not comfortable with on February 1st. Don't call anything a scheme. If you're a business, don't call anything a scheme. (laughs) Especially not loyalty. Uh, Yeah, this 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 doesn't feel great as a consumer. (laughs) Uh, But this comes as Capture One introduced subscription model pricing this year. So clearly they are pivoting away from uh, one and done licenses to subscriptions. This is just part of that transition. Take that, Adobe haters. (laughs) Fujifilm's X100V compact camera has been popular since it was released a few years ago. Now Fujifilm says it temporarily it is temporarily suspending orders on the new X100V orders so it can fulfill its significant backlog, at least in Japan. It's not clear if this will impact other regions. The brand Konica Minolta hasn't been around for a while with its camera operation sold to Sony way back in 2006. If you use a Sony camera, you have some Konica Minolta heritage in your hands. But if you're still holding on to one of the Konica Minolta branded cameras, it's going to get harder to fix. Kenko Tokina announced it's ending customer repair services for the cameras and light meters effective November 15th, 2022. So we are now past that date. You are you are in trouble. The announcement cited the exhaustion of repair parts for ending service, and they were even repairing old Minolta like light meters from the 80s and right. 90s uh, back then. So, uh, you know, if it if you're into uh, some legacy gear, uh, unfortunately, supply chain just dried up. I love the honesty, though. We just can't find the parts. Cool. <laughs> it's just this is gone. Yeah. We would do it. We don't have the parts. Yep. Epic Games launched its Reality Scan app on the iOS App Store, available in a limited beta since April. This uses photogrammetry to create a 3D model from a series of photos taken at different angles. The interface will show heat maps to show where additional images are needed. Users can export models to Sketchfab. From there, models can be used in apps like Epic's Unreal Engine. Epic plans to release an Android version in 2023. We've covered this uh, in previous episodes of the Weekend Edition. It's good to see it's finally here. Yeah, I mean, I remember reading about like using like 100 Raspberry Pis in an array, like a networked array to do this thing. And you would have to like export the render. And now you can just, 
you know, use the LiDAR on your phone to, to right. do it all in one package. It's kind of awesome. All right. Our last little quick hit here. In a statement to the Japanese publication New Switch, Rico's CFO Shun Kawaguchi said the conglomerate needs to determine which businesses to keep in order to reach its financial goals in fiscal 2023. The company has already said it plans to shift to a digital service company. Rico operates roughly 30 businesses, one of which is its imaging division, which manages its Rico and Pentax camera brands. You know, profitability on the camera side doesn't make that sound great. Like when I hear a, a faceless conglomerate basically saying that, I'm not reassured about the longevity of a brand. But there's a possibility that some of these brands could be spun off into their own businesses, and we might know the direction that might take Pentax. The brand announced just uh, this week that it uh, began development on a new line of film cameras. The roadmap calls to start with a compact camera that would be affordable to young people uh, and basically it sounds like a point and shoot, followed by a premium compact and then an SLR and finally a fully mechanical SLR, something Pentax hasn't made, I think, since the 80s or 70s. There's no guarantee in the hype video for it. Pentax's uh, Takeo Suzuki admits the company could completely fail to meet these goals. This is what they are planning on doing. They're doing research for it. There's absolutely no timetable for any of this to come out. We don't know any more specifics other than a basic roadmap, but they have a plan. Uh, I mean, that's more than some companies we've seen lately. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. As a, as a film shooter, it is. And, a, and as a Pentex film shooter, my KX is beloved. I'm excited uh, to see what they come out with, if they come out with anything. All right. Well, first up here for our discussion, uh, the French startup behind the Pixie cameras has announced that the 2023 version of its Leica M-mount digital rangefinder is the world's first camera to use a 64-bit processor. This comes from using a new quad-core ARM Cortex-A55 processor, which also includes a dual-core OpenCL 2.0 GPU, along with dedicated neural and vision process or processing processors. The chip isn't exactly new. ARM introduced the A55 back in 2017 as its efficiency core used in SOCs like Qualcomm Snapdragon 888, which isn't extremely old. Like these, these efficiency cores have a longer life, but it's not exactly brand new tech either. Exactly. Pixie says this should open up new possibilities for its software defined camera with more computational photography features, allowing it to capture true monochrome DNGs, digital negatives, and resolve finer detail. Aside from the new chip, the 2023 version of the camera features a new remote live view mode from a, from a connected phone, double the battery life, faster auto exposure calculations, an increased image buffer, and Wi-Fi 5. Yeah, I said 5. The camera is available to order now for $2,800 US. Which, I mean, for like an M-mount, that's like a bargain in, in that world. But the yeah. question is, Pixie has been making iterations of this camera since it launched it in 2018. It's previously done things like upgrade the sensor going from 12 to 24 megapixels. I think they're at now adding in an interactive viewfinder and continually adding features in firmware. Uh, if you uh, follow uh, Matthias Berling on YouTube, he has been kind of following some of the software advances they've been putting out here. Aside from being uh, from a smaller manufacturer, which has its pluses and minuses, does the idea, Anthony, of uh, you know a kind of a frequently updated camera on under the same nameplate, give you a little pause? Actually, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we've been chasing things for a long time now. Uh, as far as upgrades to, to cameras, uh, Canon just recently came out with the R6 Mark II after a few years. And you never know, you never really know when those upgrades are going to happen. However, in the, say, the cell phone market, high-end items, high-end electronics that people love to carry around and love to look forward to the next version of and love to see what new features are going to come out and they still buy them every couple of years. Now at $2,800, this is a little bit more than a cell phone, even a really high end cell phone. But the same, the same thing applies. Like if I can get a camera and I know that once I get familiar with this camera and I'm comfortable with this camera in a couple of years, I'm going to be able to upgrade this camera to a new version of the same thing with many of the same features, but you know, enhanced that is actually pretty appealing to me. Um, especially when you market the fact that this is a smaller segment, but they have been known to offer trade-ins. So you can send in your, your old camera for, you know, a discount towards a new camera. So 
why wouldn't you want that? Why why wouldn't that be a thing that that people would love? I I could just see it as being like I could see it delaying a purchase decision. Like if it's they seem to be doing this on a fairly regular cadence. I don't think it's annually that they're coming out with new updates for this, but it seems like it's 12 to 18 months. If I'm nine months out, 10 months out from this, I feel like it's, it's that it's not even the Osborne effect where, you know, the, the, the successor to something is already announced when they put out the original, but it's the idea of, you know, $2,800, not an insignificant chunk of change. So the idea of maybe delaying that purchase, I know we're in that in the camera world already uh, when we're talking about, uh, you know, uh, these these cameras sometimes have longer life cycles. So maybe this is just being from a smaller manufacturer. They don't have the same uh, uh, kind of rumor mill that's always churning with all of the with all of these other businesses. So it's like we know fairly, you know, we know we know when big upgrades are coming from Nikon, Canon, uh, uh, Sony and Fuji and stuff like that. So those aren't as surprising. I feel like it's for me, it might give me a little pause. I will say Pixie has done a good job of, you know, being able to send in your camera and they, they did the sensor swap for a cost. Um, so they do provide you with some upgrade paths depending on the upgrade. I think the SOC though, that seems like a much more significant. Um, yeah. I guess a camera sensor is pretty significant too, but that seems like a very significant upgrade that I don't know if they could just do a part swap on that to give you that upgrade. So I, I, I don't know. It, it, especially, I guess maybe because this is a rangefinder, I feel like there is the temptation to say, uh, these traditionally are very slow is a slow moving product category. And this is a very rapidly iterating company. And those two, those two kind of cultures uh, of, of like rapidly iterating consumer electronics. Uh, I'm uh, an old dude in tweed with my, like a range finder <laughs> seems like uh, th- that doesn't mesh necessarily, but I guess more takes on the market are a good thing. But again, you're you're looking at twelve to eighteen months. There's going to be an upgrade. If you don't need the upgrade, you skip past it. And if you know, That's true. Couple, but meanwhile, with Canon and Sony, you say it's not a surprise. It's because they announced it a year ahead of time. But when that announcement's going to come, you know, it could be That's two true. years. It could be five years. And then all of a sudden, they're going to announce, "Hey, by the way, in one more year, we're going to have this new updated product for you." You know, and with so, our supply chain, you'll be able to order it a year after that. A year after, yeah, <laughs> a year after release. Yeah, that's, um, that's perfectly fair. So I, I don't know. I, I think this is a, this is a great idea. It's a new take on on an old system, and I'm always up for things like that to see if that'll work. And this is kind of a niche product, but what better way to try it than than something like that? So I'm down. Exactly, I like it. Yeah. Uh, I'm interested to see what else they will do in terms of adding more computational photography features. Again, being very aggressive with kind of consumer end chips. I, I opens up a lot of possibilities that a lot of camera makers I don't think are comfortable with. So they're a cool yeah. company. Yeah, bring it on. Okay. Meanwhile, F F-stop- stoppers Wasim Ahmad wrote an interesting editorial this month, making the case that camera makers aren't doing themselves any favors with competition from phones when it comes to marketing. He points out that. Uh, A recent Nikon and Canon press releases for new products, which feature a wall of text and no images or videos from the actual devices. He compares this to the iPhone 14 Pro's press release with camera section feature uh, featuring images of the new camera system, a slideshow of images and images demonstrating all the features. Yeah. Increasingly, the audiences for these two devices are converging. I mean, we're, we're seeing more creators, uh, you know, taking advantage of kind of both, uh, traditional uh, mirror, mirrorless systems, I guess traditional mirrorless is oxymoron, <laughs> and phones. <laughs> While the camera makers often put their marketing muscle behind retail efforts, though, from things like, you know, just posters in the camera store to training sales staff, that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, Wasim argues that they would be better served meeting customers online where they are first. Okay, well, this is dovetailed by a piece by Ivor Rackman that argues the camera industry is still shooting itself in the foot by crippling entry-level offerings meant to only entice upgrades, the questionable quality control with basically every manufacturer regularly issuing recalls. Some things have to improve overall, turning away from microtransactions to unlock some features, but it took years to accomplish what seemingly no one wanted. Yeah, two pieces I think that kind of maybe speak to some points of frustration when it when from someone covering you know the camera industry. Yeah. To the marketing point first, I, I think there there's a valid point there, right? Looking at those two things, 
when you're a camera company that's putting out basically your your stock press release, right? It then become you're almost putting your marketing efforts in the hands of third parties. You're you're asking DP review to put out their review. You're asking, you know, all your influencers to put out their reviews of it and then living off of that primarily as your marketing. Right. And then obviously they do a ton of in-store stuff. I mean, you know, Nike, especially Nike and Canon, a lot of marketing out there. I do take issue though that while the audiences are converging, when you're talking about something like an R5 or an R3, I don't have a problem with that being a, a boring press release because that is a, a such a, a you know quote unquote boring or technical press release. That is it. That is strictly a professional tool, right? These are these aren't at price points that general consumers, even as expensive as phones have gotten over the years, that consumers are interested in touching. You can make that technical because you're speaking to a highly specialized audience when you get to that level of camera. Now, something like an R7 or, uh, you know, uh, a micro four thirds sensor or something yeah. like that, that's a very different situation where I do think more marketing probably would do camera makers better, more, or more, more and online first marketing, I should say. Here's the other thing with it, though. Um, when, when Canon, Sony, or Nikon, the big three, they announce a product, how many people are rushing out to pre order? Like how, how much of a pre-order window is there given and how often do we hear about, oh, the site went down because so many people are pre-ordering the, the R3 or the, the D6 or whatever, you know, <laughs> it's, it's not a, it's not a thing because the, these cameras that we're talking about here are higher end cameras that are very specialized. I, as a semi-professional photographer, am not going to pre-order anything until I've read every review and watched every review video from every creator that I trust and have had a long history of following their reviews and, and their reviews syncing with what I find to be, you know, similar tastes. So I don't need, I don't need Canon, especially since I am a Canon shooter, I don't need Canon to come out and give me a bunch of fluff during a press release because I'm going to wait for the reviewers who actually get their hands on the, the, the models first. And I'm going to take what they say, as opposed to what Canon tells me. Mm -hmm. Canon's release is kind of like an announcement. Hey, there's reviews coming for something new. And then <laughs> once the reviews come out, then I go, Oh, either I'm excited or I could pass on that. Whereas with phones, you're when the, when the pre-order release opens, those sites get slammed. Everybody wants the new phone. And we're not just talking about one one thing here. We're not just talking about, ooh, new camera. We're talking about all the different upgrades that come with phones. And all those things added together are what create the the hype. Um I don't I don't I just don't see that we need to advertise the same way between the two. Now with an yeah. R seven, an R ten, you know, the the more consumer line things, yeah. Give me frills and give me fancy stuff and let me walk in the store and see big posters of really cool stuff. But for the professional lines, we don't need it. Yeah, it's the difference between what is effectively a you know a commodity product versus, in in, in some instances, what are professional tools, but in other senses are very are still very much consumer. You know, as, as uh, shrunk as the camera market is these days. There, there is still some general consumer, you know, your 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 mom or dad cam, your parent cam, or whatever, you know. Uh, yeah. So I, I do think that is definitely still out there. The one thing I, I think there could be elements. It, it doesn't have to be one or the other, right? I agree with you that, especially on the professional set, you're going to be looking. You, you're not going to rush out and buy it first of all because you don't want to get the 1.0 firmware that's going to be buggy and terrible <laughs> anyway. Like you want to wait, you you know, you want to wait till that's fully baked before you're going to count on that to make money. But the other aspect, I, I do think there are some things you can learn from it. Like Apple has done a really good job of recent years of when they announced the new iPhone or the new AirPods or whatever, they have that screen. That's like, here's the features. We didn't even talk about all these features, but you could yep. screen cap this. or we're going to put it on our website. And this has, Oh, look in the corner there. It says Thunderbolt three. And Oh, look up here. It says, you know, uh, quantum dot, whatever that to me is like having that, for lack of a better term, single pane of glass of like, here's the notable features in a engaging way that's still information dense. I feel like you could, you could do that in a press release from a camera maker. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying you have to spend the, you know, money for the graphic designer to do that. If you don't want to Canon or Nikon, don't worry. I know budgets are tight. Yeah. I'm saying there are there, you could pick some things. I, I do think it's still a decent point to the point of the entry level stuff. I mostly feel like this has just been the, 
I, I completely agree. It stinks that like when you have cameras that can do 4K or 1080 and then they cripple the frame rates, you know, like we've seen that every camera manufacturer does that. It's mostly been let out of the market because phones <laughs> – Apple was like, we could do 4K in 2012. and Right. <laughs> and so that kind of part of the market kind of is – it's kind of addressed itself, I feel like. Yep. As, as much as I agree, Ivor, I agree with your points. Uh, I, I don't think it's necessarily quite that relevant. All right. Well, if you want to run down every single day of just the tech headlines, you need to check out our related show, Daily Tech Headlines. It's all the essential tech news in about five minutes. You can check it out at dailytechheadlines.com. Very creative URL. All right. Well, CES is coming up. Uh, we, uh, Anthony, me and you will both be going yeah. to it. We'll be covering it, uh, having a lot of fun for Daily Tech News Show. Uh, and so we're a bunch of camera geeks. So mm. we're going to be bringing a bunch of camera gear. I thought it'd be interesting to talk about what we're actually bringing and what might be kind of our uh, uh, no limit, bring anything you want uh, to it. Budget is no concern. Uh, we we are uh, billionaires that can afford the camera gear of our dreams. So, Anthony, <laughs> what, uh, uh, what, are, what are you actually bringing to CES? I'm curious. So I, I'm going not only as a camera geek, but I'm also the technical producer for DTNS. So I am going to be there basically in support of you as the quote-unquote uh, talent of the operation. We need more quotes on that. Yeah, I'm, I'm just, uncomfortable. I'm, I'm putting enough in there that I feel comfortable, but not so much <laughs> as to imply things I don't mean. Uh, <laughs> but I'll, I'll be bringing um, I'll be bringing an XF400, a Canon XF400, which is a mm -hmm. uh, a video camera. It's a 4K video camera that's got a one inch sensor. It does exceptionally well. It's what I use for soccer uh, nice. when I'm recording my kids and doing highlight videos for their for their soccer games and things like that. Uh, it's a great camera. It does great in low light, which is one of the reasons I'm bringing it because I'd like to be able to have that as opposed to relying on a smaller sensor. It, this, like I said, has a one inch sensor and it's a fully featured video camera. It's not, you know, it doesn't have like the little shortcut stuff and everything else. Uh, I'll be bringing that for any footage we want to do on the floor and, and things like that. I'm also bringing this little device here that I just recently picked up specifically for CES. And then I'm going to hand it off to my wife because she's the selfie queen. <laughs> um, and I already forgot what it's called. It's it's, it was the Osmo and mm -hmm. or it was the pocket. Now it's the Osmo. It was the Osmo. Now it's the pocket. Yeah. DJI it's, it's their Osmo little gimbal pocket. pocket gimbal cam. Yeah. Uh, two. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We're good. This is where the marketing would come in handy if we remembered the name. <laughs> right, right. G give me a name that doesn't change that actually means something and we're good to go. Um, but I'll be bringing this along uh, so we can shoot some some video from the floor nice and convenient without having to have the full over-the-shoulder camera, um, some walk-around stuff and uh, things like that. And I'll also bring bringing my Canon R5 because, of course – with my uh, 70 to 200 and my 15 to 35, I'll probably I'll probably bring my 24 to 105 just to fill in the gaps, even though it's mm. just the kit lens. But I'll probably bring that as well. So, And then uh, for audio stuff, because we will be doing audio, I'll be bringing my Zoom H6 and a handful of Shure Beta 87s. Ooh, you cannot go wrong uh, with the... Uh the beta 87 and the h6 i mean it's just, yeah they're, they're just it's a tank just, yeah yeah i mean th this is i don't know if i'm using this more for audio or to prevent muggings because all of that is really hard <laughs> what what is the so i'm not f super familiar with the xf 400 as a video what is the uh range on that in terms of uh, uh like lens like what um well it's it's got uh optical zoom from uh i want to say 0.23 out to uh, man, I'd be tough pressed. Uh, but I can catch the other side of the soccer field with it okay. pretty easily. So, and then it's okay, got digital pretty... zoom beyond that that I just I don't use. Nice. But nice. Yeah, it is. It is um, integrated in the lens. Uh, the lens is integrated. It does have adapters that you can put on top of it for telephoto and for wide angle. But I've never, never had a need for those. Um, shooting soccer games and in uh, videos for my kids and things like that. So that's cool. Uh, well, for me, uh, I don't. I have a lot of gear, but not a lot of like stuff I necessarily want to bring. Uh, so I'm gonna be I'm gonna be packing my Fuji XT30, nice small 
APS-C camera. Uh, it would be pocketable if they made a pocketable lens for it. Uh, but I'm going to bring in <laughs> just the uh, the kit, uh, 18 to 55. So that kind of goes almost to 90 uh, millimeters. Uh, it's like 28 to 90. Uh, and it's a 2.8 to 4 kit zoom. So it's, a li- you know, not the slowest thing out there. I could still do some decent stuff. It's not the greatest I, I camera mean, for it, low light, but we're, it's, it's going to be bright even on the show floor. An F2.8 kit bright. lens, that's that's a win. Just yeah, and if I'm shooting at 24 frames a second, I can you know you can slow the shutter down, so that's yep. fine. Uh, I'm also bringing my DJI Osmo Action. This is like their GoPro knockoff, uh, just because it's the most stabilized camera I own, and it'd be fun. To, I figured it'd be fun to do like some time lapses or like some hyper lapses where we're walking the show floor and just kind of doing yep. that kind of stuff to for, for, to for silliness. Uh, and also <laughs> in a pinch could be a selfie cam. Uh, and then uh, you know I'm bringing at least one film camera. I yep. think. What I'm going to bring is my Lomography LCA 120. This is a medium format camera, but it fits in a pocket. It's the tiniest medium format camera I've seen. Ultra wide, a 21 millimeter equivalent lens. Uh, and then I'm going to bring in some high speed film. I'm going to bring my Portra 800, my Cinestill 800T, because I want to take some photos in Vegas, and some Kentmere 400, which I'm going to shoot at 1600, and probably a flash to put on there, a little dinky flash, because it's still not going to matter. It's still not going to be nearly enough light for me to actually handhold anything right. uh, on there. Uh, but yeah, I'm going to geek out. But the the XC30 I really like because uh, the video on it, I've been super impressed. The stability on the 18 to 55, if we need it in a pinch, uh, can be handheld no problem. Um, and yeah, it can, you know, you can shoot 4k and crop into 1080. Uh, so I get a little more range that way, cheat a little bit that way. Uh, and just, uh, you know, you can rig it out if we really needed to, again, uh, in a pinch does USB C for power. So it's easy to charge. Uh, so nice. Uh, I, it, I think it'll be a practical choice. Nice. Um, yeah. One, one of the things about the XF 400 is that it does have, uh, XLR input directly to the camera. Uh, so that is nice. if, if we want to run sound and we just need something, Right up close, you know, actually do it like news style. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Real um, official. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And it does have uh, five axis IBIS. So Ooh. for walking around, things like that, that's really, really helpful. Um, it, again, it does great in low light. Now, my dream setup would be, of course, walking around with a Canon R5. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't need an R3 because that's, I mean, maybe just too much, too big. Okay. Like wow. I already already have a battery grip on the bottom of my R five. I don't need anything. Else. <laughs> um, you don't need th- those kind of back problems. Yeah, and and I would love to have like dream kit wise as far as the lens. I think the perfect lens for that situation would probably be the twenty four to seventy mm-hmm. uh, f. Was it f two point eight? Um, yes. Super expensive. It's like twenty eight hundred dollar lens. It's just t- more lens than I can afford. But that, along with the R5 with the IBIS and everything else, would make – that's a re- really great range, wide open, would make for some amazing video if I wanted to, and obviously some amazing photos for anything that I wanted to do. And uh, if I had it my way, I would also have one of those little uh, helmet cams that like has a little thing that sticks up from the top that has the 360 view, and that would just oh yeah yeah that would be running on a perpetual battery into a, a, a never-ending uh, a video card or a, a storage <laughs> card to just record the entire experience. Now, I didn't say you could invent technology with your dream kit. I mean, it sounds like <laughs> it's, it's all there. I just I don't have it picked out because I can't. You could just it. like swap out the SSDs or something. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, I yeah. yeah. I yeah. You. Just uh, you know, just I. I mean, I have a nice SSD in my pocket. I just I just you can put, I tunnel yeah, it all in. There. You can dream. You can dream. Yeah, in okay. a, a big backpack battery just to run the whole spiel. <laughs> so I. I don't know what this says about me for my dreams, but I went with a, a worse camera for my dream camera. I, I, so I, I'm getting I, – if I could buy any camera I wanted to take, I would actually <laughs> practically – this is a practical choice. I would get the Panasonic GH5 Mark II. I would get the 10 to 25 f1.7 zoom, just kind of my good walk around zoom. It's a beast, but I'd be able to shoot any – I wouldn't need low light performance because I can open up to 1.7. And the reason I choose the GH5 too, it can do live streaming. You can network it to your phone. does all the live streaming. You can just plug in an Ethernet cable if you wanted to, too, if you mm-hmm. want to do some wired stuff. So, like, for our use case for DTNS, it would be nice to have that kind of capability. Theoretically, we could make use of it. So, I'm with my dreams, I'm thinking of the team. I'm not just thinking 
of I, I could have said a Leica M11. I really don't want that, but like if I had a dream, maybe I would just my dream would be to sell that camera and then <laughs> buy something else and then po po pocket the uh, remainder. But I would also then bring. I'm assuming with my dream, I have unlimited budget for carry-on luggage. I would have uh, – for film, I would bring a Graflex speed graphic, like one of those old press cameras that shoots 4 by 5 Right. Uh, with like a giant flash. And I would only shoot slide film, like Provia, uh, um, uh, what it was, Velvia. I would shoot Velvia, make Ken Rockwell happy in right. Vegas uh, with a flash uh, and just be ridiculous. I would send it to a lab the same day, process it, have it back, have beautiful four by five slides. That would be my dream. Yeah. Uh, dreams don't come true. Uh, that's why we wake up. Uh, so sadly that will not be happening, but. <laughs> uh, oh, to dream, to dream. Uh, that being said, if, if you are at CES for whatever reason and you want to come say hi to us, we will not be hidden. We'll be out there. So come yeah, find us so say hi. hi. Sh show us what camera gear you got yeah. uh, if you're packing any. So that'd be no, cool to see. Knock elbows and, uh, and see what we're up to. Yeah. All right. Well, where can people send us stuff if they uh, want to know more news stories or all that good stuff? Funny you should ask because we would love to hear from people listening to the show. Let us know what photo news stories we missed or tell us what you think of this uh, episode and all the stories we covered feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com with the subject photo news monthly and remember to catch daily tech news show live that's monday through friday at 4 p.m eastern 2000 utc you can find out more about that at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live we'll be at ces next month and we'll tell you all about it in february's episode see you then about this and other shows, visit frogpants.com. Audio program so good, it's like you're there. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>